not so anonymous to the... No, I can't do that. <laughs> not so anonymous to EJ Rekka. We are here with Katie L. <laughs> today. Um, first of all, Katie, thank you for doing this. Thank you for opening up your home to us. Um, we've never met before today. We've had a couple phone calls, yeah, but you come with the highest of recommendations, oh. right? Like people that are close to me said, this woman is awesome, oh. right? And so I was super excited, actually hesitant to reach out at first, but super excited to be able to do this with you. So thank you very much for taking your time for mm. us. That's sweet. <laughs> Never get uh, tired of hearing that. <laughs> so it's still uncomfortable though. It's is funny. it? Yeah. You struggle with taking compliments yeah, as well. Absolutely. But I've learned to say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I always like to to start this thing off by asking, "What's your clean date?" Uh, September twenty third, two thousand and six. And so, what is what does that mean to you? That means I got a whole lot of clean time <laughs> and it doesn't mean shit if I don't do the work, you right. know, um, it's a special day. It's a special day. I honor that day. It's a day that like my entire life changed for the good. And so, uh, you know, we talk about two birthdays around here, but I actually probably treasure that day more than anything. Right. Yeah. That's sure. yeah. And, and I mean, for me, I, it's the same way. Like I don't, and I think it might be some of that thing. Like when somebody gives you a compliment, right? Like my, actual belly button birthday i don't want to celebrate it at all <laughs> yeah. but i'm super sad if somebody doesn't say something to me on my clean date right like i, I don't know what that is because i did that yeah right yeah. i mean by the grace of god i had an opportunity to do that yeah it's right? a very humbling day for sure yeah it's super humbling so um Anyways, like, and, I, and it's funny because these podcasts always seem to start the same way. Okay. And, and somebody's going to be watching this that's going to look at you and they're going to say, this lady's not an addict, <laughs> right? <laughs> She's like, this lady doesn't know what it's like, yeah. right? So I like to go all the way. I know where we hang out, we typically don't play in the mess too much. Yeah. But um, to qualify ourselves, sometimes I like to go back, right? Yeah. So um, like what was early life like for Katie? Like mm -hmm. what did that look like for you? Yeah, I think I, uh, it started at 12. I mean, I look at, you know, I have kids now and I look at uh, like the time frames, and I was literally dropping acid at 13 years old. Yeah. For no, you know, I came from a beautiful family. My parents have been married my entire life. They both passed now, but uh, we grew up in this house where like partying was okay. Like my parents were big time drinkers. Uh, they smuggled coke on planes, like just heavy drug users. So it was always a big joke in my house. So drinking, using, uh, it wasn't a big deal. You just had to do it at home. You couldn't like drink and go other places. You couldn't drive, but like you could do whatever you wanted to do in our house, you know? And uh, I think that because they never told me to go, no, I just wanted, like, once I started using, it was like balls to the wall full. Like, I, my sister and brother don't drink and use like me, but like, for some reason, um, it just woke up all my insecurities. I felt prettier. I felt skinnier, like all of it. Um, but like high school, uh, you know, parties, keggers, the whole kit and caboodle doing coke on the weekends. And then I just remember this one day, man, this one day we're driving to San Diego, a bunch of my girlfriends and we want to get some coke and we're like, come on. And this, my friend Yolanda brings over this little pink bag. I can still see it, the pink bag zip. And she's like, here, I couldn't get any coke, but go try this. She's like, and just do a little bit and don't gum it. But, okay, <laughs> you know? And what I could tell you is that road trip was the best road trip I ever had in my entire life. I'm 18 years old, like we're hanging out, we're partying, school's out, and like we just start using on that whole summer, just on the weekends, on our ride there, on our ride back, and then like the disease of addiction, how progressive it is, like all of a sudden it's like this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you stop, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I want some on Monday, Tuesday, and now Wednesday, you know, yeah. and then it goes from like, okay, we're going to buy a $20 sack to like, okay, now we're all chipping in to buy a hundred dollar sack, you know? And, uh, and that's kind of where it progressed for me. Uh, we did, I did start using every day and, um, something inside of me knew that what I was doing was wrong though. Yeah. So I did have this bright idea when I was like 18, I was working at Red Lobster 
waitressing and my manager pulled me aside and he's like, Katie, he's like, I, I don't, I don't, don't take this the wrong way. He's like, but are you going in the, are you making yourself throw up? And I was like, what? Like so <laughs> offended that someone could even ask me that. But no, I was in the bathroom doing freaking lines. I stopped eating. I'm cleaning up the restaurant like crazy. <laughs> I take off 15 pounds. And like something in me was like, man, like people are starting to notice now. Yeah. So I had this bright idea. I'd move down to Santa Barbara with three of my friends from high school, guy friends, and uh, try to get my college education done over there. Well, my meth addiction switched to alcoholism. Uh, I finished four classes in two and a half years. And uh, so then we're getting into 2001, 2002, and then I'm still dabbling on the weekends, coming to Modesto, picking up sacks, like doing this like stuff in your early teens when you don't really understand what's going on, but it's keeping me skinny, it's keeping me a lot, you know, all of this stuff. And so I moved back to Modesto in 2002, and uh, straight, all my friends are gone, lonely, get back with that same group, and like just start it's on it's, it's on, on and cracking right. well you know it's funny when you're like when you were talking my household was the same exact thing yeah. right it was like you know it, it's safer if you just do it here at the yeah. house right and with my personality my my parents probably meant just like drinking and yeah, maybe yeah. smoking a little yeah, exactly. bit of weed yeah. right and then when we're having like kegers yeah. During lunchtime, yeah. right? Well, your parents Every, are doing the cakes. Or yeah, cakes, everybody's cake stands. <laughs> it, well, they no, they were at work, oh, right? Okay. And and we're like just took it full blown to where we're using, you know, and and like that's the addict mind, yeah. right? That's that disease that like, oh, give me an inch, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna exactly. take a mile, right? Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I work with a couple guys. One of them, I got high for his first time at my parents' house, <laughs> right? The other one, I used to sell drugs to them at my parents' house, yeah. right? And and so, like, hearing that, it's just funny because I can I can totally relate, relate so much to yeah. that, right? Um, so now, like you were talking about, so now you're back in Modesto. Yeah, back in Modesto, drug addiction, just still don't know what an addict is. I think that's important to know. So I don't know visually what an addict is. I have a couple alcoholic aunts. I kind of know what like AA is, but I don't like to me, a uh, addict is a bum under the bridge. The people walking around with mental health, like right. in my eye, like I, so I, I have it. no idea. Okay. So I come home. Uh, I'm, I'm, I weigh, I'm in a size two. I'm in a 12 right now. I was a size two. My hip bones are sticking out. Uh, my jaw is moving. There's no eye contact. I can't keep a job. My parents are pissed. Um, and I don't know. One day I'm coming down and I'm just driving and I prayed to a God I didn't know and said, I need help, man. And for some reason I went and drove all the way to my mom and dad's house. Right. They were waiting for me. They knew the whole entire time I was tweaking. I thought I was because I, I don't look like an average tweaker. So me and my friends thought we had it going on. <laughs> we had a basement. Her dad's a famous Mexican singer. And uh, and we just, you know, hairs, nails, this, barbershop, all of it. You know, just we just thought we were so sly. But right. all of a sudden, you're like backing away from all the people that you're friends with. And it's like, and this is just the start. You know, I go to my mom and dad's house that day. And uh, they were waiting. They already had a treatment center lined up. Not a fancy one. They put yeah. me in the county facility. I go to my first treatment center in 2003. And uh, what happened for me there is I was so happy to be clean. I actually genuinely thought this was going to be like a, a big change. But I would not give up alcohol. It wasn't happening. N couldn't even fathom it. Could you yeah. imagine like a whole house? You know, it just did. So anything that they taught me in there, I was doing it my way. Um, I'm so stubborn. I think I know it all. And uh and I, and I probably stayed clean for like two months, two or three months. And then my life cycles into like learning how to smoke dope. And then it learns how to like, oh, I can get more if I date my connect. All right, well, I'm going to start selling dope out of hotels because I don't have any money, you know. So now I'm smoking more than I'm selling, you know. But I have a car, so that's kind of like my lifeline. Everybody kind of needs me because I'm going to be this person driving everyone around. And my life just goes in this vicious cycle. Like I get... I go to rehab every year for like three years in a row. Wow. But it's kind of just crazy. Like, and it just gets worse and worse. I get my car stripped and stolen. Uh, so like during that time, right? Like is your thought process like, oh, everything's falling apart 
or is that that delusion so thick to where you're like as long as i got this i got it going on okay that's gone now i got this right like is it i am so full of self at this point i am so only thing that matters is katie right I can't even, uh, I know things are going wrong, but it, you're almost in survival mode. I'm in just like, how am I going to get high one more day? And what do I need to do in order to get it? Right. And screw everything and everybody else around me. That's all I can remember thinking about at that time. I would try to do things, but it just wasn't working. I can remember living at my girlfriend's apartment, one bedroom apartment. You know, you have the little room for the dinner table. Yeah. And like I had my shutters up. This was my room with like plastic cart for my stuff and the day bed. I was fine. Yeah. I was happy as can be as long as I had dope. Right. So I don't remember knowing. I, I knew it was bad, but I just, I just remember just being so selfish and so self-centered that I didn't care about anything besides how was I going to get high tomorrow. Yeah. And I could relate. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's amazing the turmoil and the and the things that you'll adapt to when the only thing that you could think about is, is the you. next one. The next one. Right. And 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 I could see like I'm looking around like how far you've come, right? And that's what's so funny is like I know somebody watching this like we're sitting in your house. Yeah. It's beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. But life was oh horrible. Right. Horrible. Uh, And you know what's cool, though, about my story as we move on, though, like I don't regret any of that because there's so many of these spiritual experiences I had along the way. And I do want to share about that because one of them that I happened at treatment center that first time I went, I had a counselor there and she said, Katie, she said, you're one of the most self-centered bitches in here. (laughs) She said, if you don't find God, you're never going to figure this out. And I was like, who's God? I don't even know what that is. My mom's Mormon. My dad's Catholic. I was baptized Mormon and my parents sent me to church because they were hungover. Like that's all I know about God. Okay. Yeah. Which is kind of cool now right. because I didn't have any misconceptions. So when you taught me about this God in recovery, it's cool because I didn't have any other belief. So right. I just believed what you guys taught me because all my way didn't work. But I prayed one night and I, and she, I said, what, how do you pray? You know? And she goes, Katie, you just do it. So I hit my knees that night. I said, God, if you are real, can you just show me a sign, man? Like, I, I want to do this, but I don't even know if you're real or not. I literally went to sleep, woke up hella happy that next morning. That would have been probably enough because I'm a bitch in the morning. So <laughs> I, I woke up happy. I got in the shower, came in the room, and, uh, and I'm standing there. And I hear music coming on in the hallway, and it's Sarah McLaughlin, and it's Angel. And my best friend committed suicide in high school, mm. and that was our song. And there was like a, a window up here and it was a gleaming light right on my bed. And I just stood there just like I am right now. Goosebumps. So God gave me this gift now too, that like when I'm in tune with him, my whole body lights up. So you can't really deny the existence that yeah. there's spiritual realms going on. And I just stood there, this music started playing and I just started crying. And I just, that was my first moment that I could feel this entity and this power. It didn't keep me clean that moment. But when, you know, three years later, like multiple times later, like I always came back to that. Like I always tapped into that same source that she taught me that day. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, just horrible stuff after that. Living in hotels. We had this bright idea one time we were going to get clean and go to Texas, you know, do all that geographical stuff. I'm going to get out of here. We literally go on this road trip. We run out of dope in a town called Needles. (laughs) (laughs) like really we're gonna run out of dope here oh wow you know uh get to texas dude leaves me for another chick and i'm stuck in texas with nothing you know so my parents kept making the same mistake they i'm like parent you know mom dad can you get me on a plane home and they're like no you can get on greyhound i was like because i still have that like cocky like think i you know entitled It was amazing, right? Like Greyhound. all this could be going on, get on but yet, out. right? <laughs> Come home, get clean, uh, stay clean. It's usually always centered around a guy on why I make a bad decision. You know, you start dating someone when you're not like knowing what you're supposed to be doing and then everything goes to shit. Whole nother year goes by and I get just more devious. You can't trust me in your house. I'm robbing everything I can get. I'm stealing my parents' credit cards. Um, anywhere is what can I get from you? Right. 
Um, and so I was kind of sharing this with you earlier. Uh, I had this bright idea. My parents said, go to the salvation. I said, can I come home? I'm homeless, nowhere to go. They're like, if you come home, go to treatment. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'll do it. They're like, you're going to Salvation Army in San Francisco. I'm like, okay. And, uh, I'm stealing my mom's credit card every week, pulling money from their ATM. They don't have bank stuff like that. Like they do now, you know, so I'm pulling hundreds every week, have this bright idea, you know, I'm going to be clean. They're not going to give a shit. You know, they'll be so happy. I'm clean. And I showed up dirty to the Salvation Army, not knowing it, man. And then they came home, they kicked me out and I took my mom's credit cards and jammed filled up hotels, all my connects gases, pulled out money orders. I think it rolled up to about six, six, six grand or something like that. And everybody cut me off. And, uh, everybody and I, meaning my sister, my family. brother, the whole, anyone I cared about, they right. were just like, you're a loser, you know, like we're not talking to you. And, uh, man, I get a call one day. It's like three months later. I think it's about three months later. My grandma who had been out of town for like a couple months in Oklahoma called me. I could just hear her voice. And she's like, Katie, get your ass to my house now. And I was like, oh, okay, Granny, I'll be right there. I walk in. She said, go put your shit in that room. And I could tell you what, guys, I laid there and I was like, it, it was the safest I had felt in months. Right. You know, like this like I felt safe. And she said, what do you want to do? And I was like, I think I'm ready to get clean. And so we just kind of fast forward, went get, you know, went, I went to a a treatment center here in Modesto and uh, I had to get on a list and do all this stuff. So it was like another month before I got into treatment and I lied and stole from her. And yeah, I was going to say, what does that month look like? Because I mean, you make a decision that you want better, but you don't know any better, right? No, I'm stealing her coins, going to Coinstar. I'm driving her white Lincoln Continental to my hispanic connects out in the middle of like oakdale where me and my connect are pulling up to like this place where there's like underground dope and you know hunt it was yeah the literally. place and is... then the white girl comes out in the white lincoln continental <laughs> well that's what, you know I, and it's funny like it doesn't stop right yeah and and because i can remember pulling up in oakland right off of international boulevard and i'm getting out in shorts and flip-flops <sighs> right meeting the connect right i I don't belong there right but the lies that we tell ourselves like we're right at home right um so i mean now you know you're you're at the last safe place right grandma Mm -hmm. you have this option and this is your final treatment facility you're about to enter yeah and what does that look like how how is Katie when Katie walks in the doors to that? Are you like brimming with hope? Like it's, it's no, time. No, you no, know? no. I'm sneaking dope into the treatment center. I couldn't smoke enough dope that night. Uh, I wasn't going to smash the last pipe, you know? So I get to the treatment center. I smoke. No, I, I, I didn't know what, I didn't know what was going to happen. No right. clue. Just that I knew that I needed to do something cause no one was going to take care of me anymore. I needed, no, I had no desire to even be clean. I don't, well, that's not true. I did have a desire to be clean, but no clue of what it looked like. Right. Kind of felt hopeless. You've tried this a couple times. It hasn't worked. Sneak dope in, uh, tweaking worst feeling ever. Can you talk about treatment center? Yeah. Hi. Right. (laughs) Stupid. (laughs) Can you talk about the fear? Oh, scared to death. Right. Cause that's what stops a lot of us. Right. Yeah. You just. Oh yeah. If someone would have offered me a meal ticket, I would have been gone (laughs) for sure. I don't know. Yeah. It's just one of those things, man. You got to like, you really have to just trust this process. Worst case, I would tell myself worst case, this doesn't work. I'm go back to what, what I had coming, you know, but I never stopped liking getting high. I stopped liking picking up the tap, you know, I, I just like that feeling, you know? So yeah, no, just the gift of desperation, the not knowing. And I just went and it was like horrible for a few days, but then like something just happens. And I don't know why some people get it and some don't or why God saw fit like that time during that period. Or if I had just screwed all my avenues to where like this was it, I have no idea. Right. I have no idea. Uh, I know something shifted for me in there for sure. I know that like, uh, all of a sudden when I decided I was going to stop everything and give whatever these people told me a try, my spirit connected to that. Right. I don't know why, you know, they, 
and I started like every day I was learning shit, man. And I was like, I'm going to go start practicing this. I can remember, uh, we were all kind of tweakers in our room and there was, they threw a little heroin addict in there (laughs) and we were all like, Oh, get her out of our room. You know, she was shitting herself, throwing up, you know? And, uh, the the counselor (laughs) looks over at me and he said, Katie, he said, that girl's probably going to teach you more than anything in this whole entire room and this whole treatment facility. And I was like, you know, you don't understand things when they tell you, but I'll shit you not, man. That little girl taught me how to reconnect with God, how to like pray on our knees. And like, we had a couple experiences in there where she was, we were practicing and, and it was working like a little, she was going to get kicked out. She had to wake up in the morning and she couldn't wake up. So we'd pray. We'd say, God, can you just help us wake up in the morning? That next morning she was awake, prayed again next day please don't let us get kicked out of treatment. Like we just need to wake up. Can you help us? God, boom. She was awake. You know, then five days later, typical treatment stuff. She's a bitch acting up. (laughs) I'm like, I'm not praying with you. And then boom, that next day she couldn't wake up. And I was like, Oh, there's something to this praying thing. That's like shifting my thoughts, you know? Right. And then I don't know, man, I just got out of that treatment center and I made a decision that day that I was going to do this myself too. Something happened in there. Like I, I'm a taker. Everyone comes to rehab, brings me this, brings me this, brings me that, you know, like I have not asked for one thing from anybody since the day I've been clean. Never said, Hey, I need nothing. Right. I just, I decided as like a woman in recovery that I was going to learn how to take care of myself. And I did got out with a mission, man on fire, just meetings, meetings, whatever they told me to do. I said, how high, right. And I, and as, and then I, and I shifted my thought process to this, like, like a purpose. I'm going to live a purpose driven life. I don't know what that looks like yet, but so that, you know, in the steps and stuff, they teach you like, you know, you can't, you can't serve two masters. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm either going to serve this master or I'm going to serve this master. Like, which one do you want it to be? So I started serving God and then everything lit up. Doors started opening. All I had to do was put in the work, put in the work. I went to a meeting every day, twice a day, probably for like maybe three times a day. I didn't have shit to do (laughs) uh, for the first year. Well, you know, what's funny is is you touched on something like, cause I I remember being in treatment because I'm an opiate guy, right? Yeah. We didn't want to mess with no, the tweakers. No. Like even we're though we friends. were all fucked up. Yeah. Right? Like in so early in recovery, we sit there and we look at the differences. Yeah. Right. Like how long did it take you to get past that to find the similarities? Right. Cause I know After for me that experience. And that was it, yeah. right? hmm And and another thing you talk about is getting released from treatment. For me, it was scary. I was in a six month program, right? I was in that program that you mentioned before where I only the only decision I had to make was to wake up yeah. and then everything was made for me for six months besides mm-hmm. what outside meeting we were going to go to or yeah. whatnot. So like you talk about, you just plugged right into a 12 step fellowship and, and yep. that's what worked. So when you, when you leave treatment and you do that, what does that look like for you? Like walking into the rooms where you like, I'm, I've arrived. Right. Or no. was it like, I'm keeping to myself. Uh, I have an aunt that I mentioned earlier that was an alcoholic. Uh huh. And she came from this small little fellowship. Modesto has hundreds of AA, NA, all kinds of different meetings. Um, but, but my aunt was connected to this little itty bitty fellowship. They were a little bitty family, probably 10 to 12 people a night. And, uh, and I was scared. Yeah. And before she had asked me to go a couple years back and I was like, oh man, how, how long do you got to go to those things? <laughs> yeah, right. That doesn't even <laughs> like, who does that? Like, that's not me. <laughs> Uh, and, and so I got to go to my first meeting with her and it was all her family and her like support group. And they just, they were all old people and they welcomed me with open arms. They were like book thumpers. Yeah. Um, I loved it cause they taught me the literature, literature, literature. Every meeting was a topic out of the literature. Uh, and so I felt at home, this was my, my first like four years of recovery. It's kind of boring. Like I'm yeah. excited. I'm, you know, I'm clean. I'm doing this thing. I'm going to meetings. And I know exactly why God did it. It kept me away from men because all these people were old. No one was hitting on me, <laughs> yeah. okay? which was cool. Not that I wanted it. I, I mean, everyone else in the fellowship gets hit on, but no, no one really hit on me. So it kind of didn't even give me that option. 
Um, I'm connected back with my mom and dad. We had a, an incident um, once I got clean because they didn't come to no family groups. They didn't visit me. Like, it wasn't this old way of doing things. Like, yeah. they were done. Uh, but I was mending that relationship with my mom and dad, so I was spending a lot of time with them. And um, I started going back to school. My life was real simple for a couple years. And I think that it was good. I'd go to this meeting with like old timers and then I would take the knowledge they gave me and take it back to my outpatient and share with them over there. The knowledge, you know, so it was about sharing this knowledge of the yeah. literature. When you probably That's felt, where I grew. Yeah. And you probably felt real important, right? Like you're getting poured yeah. into by these old timers oh, yes. and you walk into the outpatient yeah. like, listen to me. Right. Yeah, I did. I and did, that's probably. what, and that's probably what kept you clean, yeah. right? Is finding Absolutely. some sort of purpose. You know, yeah. I, I know, where I come from right now, it's really tough out in Los Angeles in a rural area, you know, because people start getting clean, but they can't find a purpose outside of that room, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and they get lost. Yeah. You know, so how awesome is that, right? Right. And so God keeps smiling on you. So what so so now you're you're pushing on in recovery, like so what is that like what does no, that start turning into? I mean, yeah, sponsorship went through. A, uh, it was in a not the same fellowship I am in now, but I was in a, you know, a different fellowship at the time. Did my steps all 12, like um, loved my sponsor. She was just like walking me through each, you know, every step of the way. I felt like I was learning. I was like internalizing it. Um, I was employable, but I was still making mistakes and stuff, which I right. think is important. Cause like, we don't get here and start like shitting rainbows, yeah. you know, <laughs> like I was still doing like stuff, but now that I look back on it, because now that my kind of part of my story as we move later is like, my parents are both gone now. So I think that I am so glad for that quiet, peaceful time for those. Like it was about three years. I was focused on recovery, going back to school, getting like all those F's and D's that I had and like being and working. So I was waitressing, still trying to find like a career path and all that kind of stuff. But things were calm. Right. Until about year like three and a half, three and a half, four, my mom's diagnosed with cancer. I just mm. grad graduated Stan State. So I went from MJC to Stan State. I still don't really know what I want to do with life, but I'm like, I want a degree. So let's go do this, you know, get my degree at Stan State. And uh, that same night of my graduation party, my mom falls. Mm passes out bleeding everywhere take her to the hospital and we find out she has um uterine cancer and so my whole recovery kind of shifts now because and i'm kind of flip-flopping in between uh treatment uh, not treatment uh fellowships right now which is kind of and and i know that i w got my foundation here but i I found this kind of like new love over here. Right. And so, and it was exactly where I needed to be because this one I came into is all young people, my age, uh, a group of people that just swarmed me. And, uh, so my mom is in cancer doing like gets cancer, starts chemo. And this fellowship just swarmed me. Right. They did not let me nothing like, you're going to go to meetings, Katie. You're going to share about it till you can't share about it no more. We got you. And that is exactly what they did. They goosebumps. Right? Yeah. They just, I had uh, probably, I, I'm getting the little dates a little confused too, but like in this fellowship, I just met my husband. He wasn't my husband there, but he, my first boyfriend in recovery, like, you know, I, I have about five years clean at this point. So I have a new boyfriend, new kind of recovery family. My mom's sick and I'm just trying to do what you guys taught me in here. So like, just like the just for today said today, like I can't just practice it here. So like I started having like doing what you guys taught me. Like I showed up to my parents' house every single day. Right. I'd crawl into bed with my mom and I would let her hold me. Mm. Um, I'd try to have honest conversations with her, but then I realized she wasn't, she there. couldn't have those. And so I learned my lesson. Like mom, if you don't want to talk about this, we don't have to talk about this. Like she believed she was going to live. And if you want to, go into your death knowing that maybe you might have one more day. I was going to have to be okay with that. Yeah. But that was like my big hit in, in since being clean, but fellowship. And then, uh, and I, we just held her hand until well, she passed away. And what like an amazing process going from like being the one nobody wants to be around yeah. to being the one that gets to show up be present and be that person in your like what does that mean to you early in recovery right to be able to be that person for your mother it's probably the best feeling i've ever had and i'm i know i'm not going to jump around here but i'm going to and 
it's to your point. Mm -hmm. So that kind of started that process. But listen to this. Fast forward, me and my dad become best friends after this. And he <laughs> it is crazy because I'm the one who robbed you blind. I'm <laughs> the one who stole, lied. I was your worst kid. My dad, two years ago, has a heart attack mm. and passes away. He kind of knew he was sick. Who do you think was in charge of all of his money? <laughs> 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 Me. Right. He didn't trust my sister and brother farther than he could throw them. I hope they never listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. Right. All, not all of it. I mean, he had a trust to my parents' estate and all that kind of stuff. But like all of his hidden money, like I could have banked out with like a hundred grand if I didn't even have to tell my sister and brother. Right. But he knew I would never do that. You know. So back to your question is like, yes, like the recovery. cat's out of the bag. No recovery <laughs> taught me that. Like yeah. they, it went from being the lowest of the scum to the person that they trusted the most in this world. Wow. And they love my brother and sister too. You know, my, they're great people. They're not addicts, you know? Um, but yeah, when it came to stuff like that, he knew I would do the right thing. Right. I've shown him in the last 16, you know, at that time, 14 years that like, I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. Right. And, and those are the gifts of recovery, right? It's simple things. And, and me and, and Jesse were talking about on the way up here. He's like, everybody just talks about just showing up, just right? Show up. Like learning to show up. Like, what has that done for you in, in your life? I mean, you, you explained some me powerful how, things, yeah. right? Taught me how to show up. I don't, if you don't answer your phone, I'm coming. Right. What's the worst case? You don't answer your door, you know? And my grandma taught me don't go empty-handed. I'm a cooker. I'm going to cook you something. I'm going to make you something. I'm going to bake something. And in doing that, like, I heal. Right. It's not always about everybody else. But by them showing up for me and showing me what that looks like, I now know how to do that for people. Right. Now, my sponsees are walking through stuff, and, and, and they come to me like, Katie, like, what did you do? Well, I don't know. I just showed up and they show up. They just come. That's what recovery and like a support group and a foundation, like that's a, a huge piece. It's not the only thing. No. But it's a big piece. Yeah. Huge and, piece. Well, and, and through like the process of getting your degree, mm -hmm. you know, this family stuff. Oh, you got to listen to that. I got a good story okay. for you on that well, let, too. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So mom passes away. I meet my husband. We get married uh, and have this, you know good life. And, um, so it's time to have a family. Right. And so we're trying and we're trying and like, I'm at meetings and I'm pr crying to my sponsor, like nothing's working, you know, like, what do we do, man? And I'm sad. My friends are having kids. Everyone, are, I'm 42 now, you know, my daughter's five and, uh, one day at book study, uh, it's, we're floating in the pool, you know, having a <laughs> girls I've been committed to book study every Wednesday for 16 years just wow. so you know so I, I'm a committed person I learned to suit up show up and keep my commitments it might not be every day but at least I keep that so I'm at book study and one of my sponsee sisters Erica goes hey uh, my daughter's pregnant with her third kid she's living in a tent on the west side and uh and she's gonna give it up for adoption she's like maybe you should reach out and I was like that just sounds too crazy. You know, yeah. I'm thinking in for a vitro, 20 grand. I don't have any of that money, you yeah. know? <laughs> and, uh, and boom, that girl, Jasmine reaches out to me that day on her own says, Hey, I'm going to give this baby up. What do you and your husband think? I'm like, I don't know. So I, you know, told my husband and, and he told me no, hmm. my husband doesn't tell me no. Usually, you know, it's, yeah. it's very <laughs> rare. <laughs> He might. No, he doesn't tell me no, usually. Uh, and he told me no. And I'm not going to go into why, because I hate the reason why uh, yeah. he didn't want to. Uh, so I'd cry to you. And I'd cry to you. And I'd cry to you months. Like a, a month went by or so, you know. And I, we were driving to an, a meeting that night and getting our little ice cream. And I said, dude, check it out. Like, if you don't want to do this, like, I'm going to take that money. Because we had a little secret stash. And I said, and we're going to do it this way. And he's like, you know, he was out running that day. And he's like, hey. I just envisioned my Christmas card. It's me, you, baby, you know, and, and Max at the time. I'm like, are you serious? And, um, and I share this story with you because it was a yes. And, and God, 
I trusted him this whole process. So for five years, I've been praying to God for this family, a baby. I know you're going to, I know you're going to give me what my heart desires. I just don't know when I went and saw people like people put hands over me. I went to this one spiritual retreat and this lady puts hands on me and she goes, you're a mother of all nations and you'll have two kids. And I was like, what does that mean? So, you know, four years later, uh, and this adoption was perfect. We got a lawyer. My daughter's mom went to my baby shower. Like I was in the room when my daughter was delivered. Uh, she never changed her mind. She still thinks I saved her life. She doesn't know she saved mine. It was the first feeling that I had had a joy since my mom died. And this daughter just like, like it was all God. All God. Like it's crazy. Like people go, how did you do that? And I'm like, it was God because never once was I fearful. No, nothing. Like it was straight recovery, straight spiritual principles, straight faith in the process. And now it's me and my husband. I do have an older son too. Uh, it's 23. My husband's son. We've had him since he was 12. So I do have three kids actually. And then I had my daughter, Amelia. And, uh, and after that, I was so, jo- I'm getting my master's degree. I'm in school full time. Two months before graduation, we find out that that's when Amelia was going to be born. So I would have never been able to have this baby and like work towards my dream job. So it's like God saw fit, like right at the end of this job at school, we're going to bless you with this baby. And then it was like, boom, we bought this house, got my baby, like finished my master's program, like had my dream job. And you would think life would be good, but that's not the way this world works. No, you can have everything you think you want. And it just, I don't know, just, it gets harder. So now like fast forward to like, how do you have everything you dreamed of? I tell people this, but you want to slice your throat on a regular basis. Yeah. You know? No, I get like, it. I don't understand. I'm how raising kids. <laughs> all of these things that I prayed for and desired and have. And it seems like recovery is almost getting a little bit harder. Like, you yeah. know, us newcomers go to meetings and we talk shit about these old timers of like, why don't they come to meetings and why don't they do this anymore? And all this young folks get, you know, do all the work. But I do know what they're talking about a little bit yeah. now. What's it, you know, and I always share with people, you know, be careful what you pray for because your blessings are going to become your burdens. Right. And, and I didn't have the luxury of having early recovery Mm. without kids with, without, you know, like my, my early recovery was six months in a program where I got to focus on me and then then right back. Like I got clean and people were telling me, you know, everything that you did in your disease, um, you know, that's, that's the past. Right. So then I almost started applying that to my kids. Cause mm. I, I'm like, man, I, I, the first time I was around my kids, I'm like, I don't know if I could fucking do this. Yeah. This is a lot. Right. And, um, so I get it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I love my children. Oh, like yeah. I love them so much, <laughs> but they are so difficult. <laughs> 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 They're so hard. So I get it. Right. Yeah. You know, and I still have to make time. Right. Like, like we were talking about the reading earlier is trying to find that balance between recovery and life, Mm -hmm. you know, family life, whatever that looks like. So like, what is that? I do. Yeah. What do you do? I want to know. Uh, so I'm committed to my sponsorship family. We meet every Wednesday have since I've been clean. And then me and my husband have our home group. It just happens to be on the same day, same time. So because my, my daughter's five and then I have, we adopted another son at two and a half months. He's two and a half now. Uh, but we have to switch off days. Yeah. And then I have a service commitment that I've had for the last six years of the ties up bind to, Oh, a women's retreat committee. Yeah. So I've been doing that. We only meet once a month, so it's not like too crazy. I can bring the kids if I have to. So one meeting that's mine, one meeting that we switch alternate weeks and then the committee meeting. And then we do a lot of stuff in like all of our friends are in recovery. So like, Tomorrow night, 30 of us will go to pizza for my husband's clean time. Like we go to Hawaii, we go to the Bahamas, uh, we travel, we watch each other's kids, uh, four, two of my sponsees work out with me every day. You know, we are, go to CrossFit kind of training and I get people involved in the things that I like to do so yeah. that it's not just recovery, but we have to like show up like but I show and I do step work. I might have been sitting on a step for a minute, but I finished yeah. <laughs> uh, another round uh, and I'm on step three. So I meet with my sponsor 
And lately I've just been trying to learn how to be as honest as I possibly can with myself and not get caught too caught up with everything else. Right. Cause it's really still an inside job, but with the, you're like being married, we're 10 years in 11 years in, like it gets a little different. We have two kids and it's hard, you know, yeah. the 10 years, you know, before this was real easy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, it's hard it when you got a, when you got a toddler yeah. trying to sleep in between you every night. It's we challenging, have we right? Have a five-year-old sleeps with us, and uh, two and a two, he's two and a half. Joey, and he's a handful. Just shoot that. We did foster to adopt with him right after my dad died. So I have this thing: you lose a parent, you get a kid. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'll tell you even cool recovery in that we're in Hawaii with like all of our friends and, uh, we literally touched down a plane. Phew, I get a call. Hey Katie, you know, COVID had just lit, lit, let up. My dad just passed away and they're like, Hey, we got a two and a half month old little kid for you. Parents abandoned him at the hospital. Never came back. What do you think? You know, I was like, God, so I literally come home from this beautiful trip to a kid like a month later. Wow. And, uh, don't know who his parents are. Don't care. I know a little bit of history, but um, I know we're taking that kid back to that same spot uh, in May. How cool he'll be like almost three. So I'm like, how cool is that to like go back to the spot where we like found out about him and stuff? Yeah. So do you ever like sit back and think about how far you've come? And I know it's, it, you know, for a lot of people, they're like, oh, I don't take credit for it. Right. But do you ever reflect on it thinking where you were and where you are now? And how much of a miracle that is that like where we're sitting, you know, the beautiful family you have up here and all these things. Like, do you ever reflect on that and, and, and give yourself a little pat on the back or are you tough on yourself? No, I, I'm not too tough on myself, but I definitely should sit down and I think process more. Yeah. Um, usually my processing is when I see a miracle in somebody else. Right. Right. Is when I can like stop and like feel that because I'm a stuffer I'm an eater I'm a th I'm a goer so sometimes it's uncomfortable when you stop yeah right uh but no I I, I I'm proud of myself yeah as you I'm should so, be so I'm really am I think I'm proud of myself I think I live a kicked ass life um I feel like I'm sorry Katie. yeah go ahead you just screwed up your mic Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scooting back. <laughs> um, no, I am. No, I'm proud of myself. And I'm the type where I see miracles daily. Right. If not daily, like weekly, like significant stuff. Because I wake up every day. I say, God, I'm all yours. What are we going to do today? And help me show as much love and as much purpose as you you and I could possibly do today. So you're leading into what you Every do day. for a living, right? Every day for a li yeah. So li what do you do for a living? Okay, so I am a mental health clinician. Right. Uh, I worked with San Joaquin County Behavioral Health for like eight years or so. And I have my dream job. So not most people can say they work for the county and they have their dream job. But I was, I keep getting handpicked for special positions and they love me because they love that I'm an addict. Right. They love that I'm recovery, but they love that I've gone to school and I've educated myself. And now I run like a diversion program out of the district attorney's office. And I get these kids who are felons, first time gun offenses, robberies, burglaries. And I get to go to their house. And interview them just like you and I are right here. Come to their house and I interview them and I smell out for horse shit. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a clinical word for that, but that's what I do. Yeah. And I'm and I'm gauging because they don't know what I know. And yeah. then once they know I know what they know, they're like, Oh, okay, this chick knows a little bit, you yeah. know? And um and they become my little buddies, man. I tell them, I'm your new best friend that you didn't even know you needed. And I mentor them. I have a whole team, so I'm not going to take all the credit. Uh, and man, they're like, they still call me. My people call me on a regular basis, always. And the district attorney dismisses those felonies uh, if I see fit. Wow. So yeah. you have that power. I have a little bit. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. They, that's they, awesome. they have the power. Those, they, they have the power. Yeah. I'm not going to take credit for that. They do the work and I get and I guide them. And it's, and I guide them on a spiritual path, man. And I look for a little, any bitty window that I can like talk recovery into them. Yeah. Any chance I get. And not only the youth, man, the district attorney's office, they hate us. 
<laughs> Truthfully, right? Yeah. They don't they don't believe in this. And I have seen so many district attorneys come to me and say, Wow, Katie, like I, I'm looking at this from a different set of lenses. Like they they don't want to give these kids opportunities, but they trust me. Right. And they say, Katie, if you go out there and you tell me that there's hope, then we're gonna like let you do your thing. So now they, they nobody checks on me. They don't like, I don't answer to anybody. I go in, I do my work, and they're happy. And I come home and don't even feel like I'm at work. That's awesome. Like, right? So, like, if you ever sit back and, and think, God, why me? Right? That's why. Why? Right? And, yeah. And it and actually, uh, I was at a kid's house, just like this, <laughs> six years ago. And I walked out after meeting with them, and this I just loved this kid, man. And I walked out of there, and I'm like, you know when you're like jumping careers? I was a substance use counselor, not knowing. I know I needed to make more money. I don't think I recovery, you get, I don't think I got here to like stay stagnant. And I talked to God that day. I said, God, uh, I could do this, and I could probably make a little more money, <laughs> and I could probably help more people. And that's how me and my God work. He shoots me in this direction. Boom, I was in school two weeks later. Wow. I don't know how the hell I got there. I'm a C student all day long, but I do have a gift and yeah. I can connect with people. It's a gift. God gave it to me and I use that in school. And so I ace that school. I'm having a little harder time passing that license exam because it's more of like the reading comprehension and memorization, which I suck at, Yeah. but I can connect with you all day long yeah. and teach you. So I, I see like how that great that could be, but then I have this other like struggle right now where I've failed this test three times and feel worth. So I jump from every day. Yeah. Some days suck. I have to take this test in 30 days and I feel hopeless. But right. then I'm over here and I like love my kids. I love my recovery. So like, I feel like as I get older in this recovery game, things get more confusing. Right. Well, that's life. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, you know, it, we're, we're constantly being stretched as human beings and, and what would life be if there was no challenges, right? It would just be too easy. Yeah. Um, so like what, like what keeps you in the recovery process, right? Like I understand, mm. like, cause even with like the work you do, like some people say, Oh, I got it. I, I get it over here. I get it no. over there. But at, at this point, like what keeps you plugged in, you know, to the 12 step process, the fellowship, like what, it, like what keeps you going? My girls. Right. Sponsorship. Right. All day long. No, I, I love my work, but my work is not my recovery hand. No, uh, it's the sponsorship right. on days when I don't want to do this anymore. I would never let them down. A person told me at like year five, I had never sponsored anyone. And she said, Katie, you're only getting half of what this program has to offer. And I was like, once again, the hell is she talking about? Right. I have no clue. Boom. Started sponsorship. My whole life changed. It opened this magical door. It's like getting to see these girls and grow on a regular basis and the bonds of watching this. I don't think I could ever, it keeps me plugged in because then I have to do the work key. I'm not going to teach you something and not apply it to my own life. Right. right. So I think that the, I have this kind of rule on my hands and it's like, I have a God, I have a sponsor. I work steps, I give back and I sponsor. And as long as I'm doing like all five of those things kind of on a regular basis, I stay pretty balanced, but I can't just do one or the other. I know that's my favorite part, but five things, regular basis. And I stay pretty sane. Yeah. Cause I, I, for the first time had the experience where a guy that I helped went out and helped somebody else. Right. right? And I was like, <laughs> like, that's better than a bag right yeah. there. You know, like that was like the feeling. Right. Yeah. And so I get it. Mm -hmm. Right. I get it. Um, so like what, like, so I, I mean, we pretty much touched on a lot of different mm -hmm. things, but so if, if somebody's like listening to this podcast right now and they hear what you're saying and it resonates with them, mm -hmm. like, what would you tell somebody that may be stuck in, in that sort of life? Right. And, in, and, in, can't really see a way out, right? Doesn't mm -hmm. believe there's a way out. They can't get to where Katie's at. Mm -hmm. What would you tell somebody like that? That just believe in one person. Right. Go find that one person that's going to help you. Like, we don't trust people when we get here. Like, I know you have no hope, but it, it's going to take one person to make a difference in your life. And just, you need to trust that one person. And not the person that's going to get you the bag, you know, right. but there's one person you have to invest in. Even when you, if, or walk into that meeting, man, 
scary as hell. Find someone to go with you. Find a mom, find a dad, find a grandma. Like you don't have to go alone. But I would just tell you for like one day, it's going to be like worth the risk, whatever it is. Right. Whatever it is. You have to have that. You, you can't do this thing by yourself. And so, yeah, you just have to trust one person that will help you get there. Awesome. Right. And, and if you're really struggling and listening to this and like really have no way out, I feel like there's super like warm lines, crisis numbers, 211 on your phone right now. Like you can call and get into any treatment center in any town in the United States of America. Medi-Cal pays for it. There should be no reason. There's no excuse why somebody who really is dying right now and wants help and can't like there's one stop shops in every town, everywhere you go. Call 211, get a number and like go. Right. It's cold outside. It is. <laughs> Everyone gets clean, you know, like it's cold outside. It is cold. I know people don't want to sit in the rain, you know, out there freezing. Everyone gets clean in the winter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all, uh, no, I got clean in June. Whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I got in September, so I'm not one of those, but you see the numbers pop up. Oh, I get it. Yeah. We got warm coffee. <laughs> we got hot coffee. So before we close out, is there anything else that we didn't hit that you want to share? No, I just think that uh, one thing I kind of instill in people that I think drives a lot of our addiction to is our traumas. We didn't go into that. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that important right now. But like you sh should know that like trauma comes out in all different areas of your life. And so like figuring out that process when you get to recovery is going to be key. Right. I think, I think we, I think we did it. Um, Katie, we end this the same way every time we end it with a hug. We do? Yes. Okay. So I need to give my hug. And again, thank you for letting us in your house. Your beautiful home. Oh, appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Trip like you'd be the first one to hug or fall before we got to this part. <laughs>